today uh, uh, 52nd anand krishnan uh, colloquium we have uh, with us uh, dr ankur srivastava he is from university of technology sydney australia uh, uh, here is a biography of dr ankur srivastava he has done his btech uh, from agriculture university uh, from acharya ng ranga agriculture university hyderabad and uh, he did his mtech uh, from it karakpur uh, then um, he did his phd from department of civil engineering university of newcastle australia and uh, he has a uh, um, experience uh, basically in developing best practices practices using uh, uh, himavari geo geo potential products for enhanced sub daily monitoring of australia's ecosystem uh, which he'll be explaining uh, in in his talk and then he is working on collaboration with uh, nasa on various project and uh, uh, basically he is a research associate at the school of engineering institute of uh, newcastle uh, in australia uh, during august uh, to september 2021 and uh, his research interest is uh, irrigation and watershed management agriculture engineering and technology hydrology and water resources and uh, uh, there are many uh, list is available like for example this evapotranspiration and measurement eco hydrology hydrological modeling and uh, he has uh, a numerous number of publications uh, in his uh, uh, record and then uh, he has many uh, research awards and achievements and then uh, he has uh, projects grant funding and this thing so i'm not going in detail so and then uh, i would like to request dr ankur srivastava please deliver a talk So thank you, Dr. Yogesh, for the nice introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. So today, basically, I got the opportunity to present some of my research, which I have been doing in. And this research is basically a combination of, you can say, eco hydrology and the geomorphology. So the feedback between these two. So, uh, so the title of the talk, talk is Climate Soil Vegetation Interactions, Eco-Hydrogeomorphic Inferences from the Models and the Remote Sensing Approach. So in this talk, I will mostly touch on the modeling part and I will just give you uh, the short introduction what I am doing in the remote sensing as well rather than diluting much. So I will just focus on this. So yeah, so where I'm from, so basically uh, I'll give you a brief intro of UTS. So this is basically lo located in Sydney and uh, which is in the east coast of the Australian continent. And you can see this is the top view of the uh, University of Technology, Sydney. And this is located in the CBD. It's, it's highly densely popul populated, just a few minutes walk from the Opera House and the Darling Harbour. And... Uh, so if you would like to see, so this is the buildings, how it looks like. So I have an office at this floor. So this is from the top, the, it's the third one. And basically these are the, so it's a public research university and in Sydney, and it was founded in 1988 with origins from the 1870s. And it was, uh, it has a huge involvement of a lot of uh, great people, such as uh, you can say John Howard, which who was a late prime minister, and then Pat Cummings, if you know, he's a present Australian captain, so he's from this. He's the alumni of UTS, and uh, so if he, uh, the UTS is a founding member of ATN, which is a part of uh, universities in Australia. So ATN is basically a technological network. So he, UTS is the founder, and also it is also a part of uh, WUN, which is a worldwide university. So it has a nine faculty, 130 undergraduate and 210 postgraduate courses, and it hosts a number of research centers. Yeah, and it is ranked 90 globally. So recently it has gained a lot of uh, hype in the news as well, in the global as well as in the national news. So just uh, as Dr. Yogesh mentioned, so I will just also uh, elaborate on that. So, so, so I did my BTEC in agriculture engineering from the Acharya NG Agri uh, Ranga Agriculture University, Hyderabad. And... Uh, so now they have changed the name after the separation of the state. And uh, so there I got the opportunity to work at National Institute of Hydrology. And uh, where I got insights that I was fascinated about uh, water related problems. So it was a four months project, but which made me to pursue my career 
later and then I uh, got admitted into the land and water resource course program in MTech at IIT Kharagpur. And there I was the youngest member which was involved in the uh, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology ITRA project. And it was a multi-institutional project across the India. So several institutes, IAS, CIT, Bombay Lab, like many institutes were involved in that. So my portion was the hydrological modeling of the uh, Kangsabati River Basin, which is an eastern, uh, which is which is in the West Bengal, eastern part of India. So and that was uh, that was a pretty uh, good experience for me. And then I got the Commonwealth uh, uh, scholarship to get uh, to pursue my PhD in civil engineering and uh, from the University of Newcastle, Australia. And uh, well, I worked with uh, experts from USGS and uh, which made me to think several <laughs> problems related to geology because my background was in agriculture. So I learned many concepts of the geology and geomorphology. And I was also an OZVEX fellow. So I got uh, selected for the uh, summer internship uh, across the globe. So they select 18 students. So I was one of them to the ANU, which is the number one university in Australia. And currently I am working as a postdoc at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, so UTS, which is a TURN funded project. And uh, it's a multi-institutional project as well funded by TURN and Australian Research Council. And I'm also involved in the uh, GeoNex mission of the NASA. So I will just briefly hear summarize that what my research is basically. So uh, right from the global scale to the regional scale, if you can see this arrow. So I have been working on several scales, so global, continental and regional. So and when you go from global scale to the regional scale, the complexity increases. Not only in the vegetation, but also the interaction between the vegetation, climate, land and water. And when you are going from the regional to the global scale, so there is also a necessity for the remote sensing and GIS application increases because at point scale, you can do observations, but at a field, uh, at a field scale, you can use the observations as many as you can. But when you go at the catchment scale or at the continental scale, you need some observations from the satellite because you can't point and you cannot make a dense network. Even if it is a dense network, it, it would not be uh, homogeneous, homogeneously distributed and so many other factors are there. So remote sensing is one of the thing which is. So here, uh, the map here shows the vertical zonation map and it is known as very popular from the taken from the Wit taken 1975, which shows that the vegetation is only dependent on precipitation and temperature. Based on the precipitation and temperature, you can classify the vegetation across the globe. So that's how uh, he classified. So I just uh, bought that idea and I just so my research is basically in the middle latitude. So I'm focusing on the forest, woodland, chaparral, grassland and desert. So so I am uh, much more oriented toward this zone. So this zone, OK, so this is basically middle latitude. And I will shortly uh, give you a brief introduction about the satellite portion. But first, I will focus on this vegetation. OK. So today, basically, I will be talking about this uh, work, which was basically, uh, uh, you can say, my PhD work, and uh, where I investigated the influence of orographic precipitation on the cold evolving landforms and vegetation in semi-arid ecosystems. So please be careful. This is semi-arid ecosystems. The conditions will change if you go into the different climatic system. So I think everybody knows that uh, this rain shadow. So yeah, so this rain shadow effect is pretty much known and uh, we can see mostly in the mountainous region. So when uh, what happens that when you have a mountain, so due to this uh, hindrance. So you have uh, the rain shadow effect. You have more rainfall on one side of the mountain and less rainfall on the other side. So this is known basically as the windward direction and the other side is known as the leeward direction. And what happens uh, because of that, that uh, high rainfall on one side of the mountain leads to the high vegetation. OK, and other side has a sparse vegetation. And uh, due to which what happens that you will have less run runoff because of the vegetation establishment. So that's the general concept. OK, so this is the science which theory everybody knows, and this is also known as orographic influence of precipitation. 
So in the real world, you can see many places, and uh, these are some of the uh, observed sites. So there are many places. So because New Zealand is close to Australia, so we chose this site as well, and we were funded for that project as well. So so you can see this is the Lake Pierce. Uh, this is New Zealand, and uh, one this is windward side of this mountain. So this is New Zealand Alps. Okay. One side of the mountain is the Fox Glacier with high vegetation, dense vegetation, and one side it's almost you can say it's a dry, which is a uh, leeward side of the mountain, and several uh, different types of vegetation exist on both the sides. So with that, so not only this phenomenon of orographic influence, so this has been done with uh, in the late you can say 1800, the people have shown like. Uh, many great researchers, they have given this phenomenon of orographic long back. So it's not a, a new concept, but the new thing is that uh, apart from that, there is also an aspect control solar radiation. So what I will uh, talk about that, what is that basically? So as you know, the vegetation plays a crucial role in controlling soil erosion over the topography. So if you have a higher vegetation, the general uh, consensus is that you will have a less runoff. That's known. And plant needs water energy for photosynthesis because this is a photosynthesis equation. So two major components you need. One is solar energy and one is water. So based on this, across the world, the ecosystem is divided into energy limited and the water limited ecosystems. So here comes the role like what I've in water limited ecosystems and why I'm saying water limited. So we are talking about semi arid. So in water limited ecosystems where energy supply far exceeds water supply. So this process is limited by available soil moisture. OK, and when you have a limited soil moisture, it happens because of the differences in the solar radiation. So what happens? So this concept. So this is uh, this is uh, basically a pick uh, which which shows you that uh, one side, so if you have a mountain, so there is a leeward and windward, but apart from that, in the windward and leeward, we will have different aspects. So what happens, that solar radiation falls on the south facing, which is pretty much higher than the north facing. And this is, uh, this is occurring in the northern hemisphere. So if you talk about regions in Australia or South America, all these will be reversed. So we are talking here strictly to northern hemisphere. And generally, south-facing slopes receive 20% more solar radiation than the north-facing slopes, and it has been it's been well reported through observations and many other papers, and vice versa in the southern hemisphere. So, what does this mean? Is so this give rise to an aspect differences in the solar radiation. This, this is the phenomena which is known as aspect control solar radiation phenomena. So what happens because of the radiation on the one side, you will have more evapotranspiration and you will get drier conditions. So one side is drier and other side is wetter. Do we have such uh, real world examples? Yes, we do. Where? So this is one of the site in Mongolia. So then you are in Chuha, Mexico, New Mexico and Idaho. Yeah, and we do have in India also. So these are the sites where you can see that one side of the slope is having generally north facing slopes is having higher vegetation and then the south facing slopes is having less uh, sparse vegetation and that is due to the radiation. So how does this phenomena uh, is driven? So what's the mechanism behind that? So you can see that uh, this uh, these are two blocks, two columns. So first A figure shows you the uh, insulation distribution of the north facing slope. And the B figure shows you the insulation distribution of the south facing slopes. So when you uh, see the A figure, so what's there? So and the y axis, you have a slope. OK, so it tells you the steepness. On the x axis, you have a day of year. So this is a uh, you can say a pattern of the solar radiation here. And this shows you the different drying one, drying two, North American monsoon and the drying one. So these are the approximate growing season which have occurs in the uh, northern hemisphere. So I'll talk about first about north facing slope. What happens here? So, so if we take just uh, one slope, which is at 30 degree uh, here. So if you just see uh, at 30 degree slope, the insulation is basically uh, insulation is basically 0.4. So if you see here, so it's close to 0.4 here. And similarly, if you go to the gentler slope at the 10 degree, the insulation is 0.8. Okay. 
and when so you can see that as we go towards the steeper steeper slopes the insulation decreases that means the radiation decreases okay so keep in mind this has to do with the orographic influence because orographic influence shows you that as you go towards the higher altitude your precipitation increases and then in combination you have a aspect okay and the reverse happens in the south facing slopes as you can see that uh, the insulation uh, ratio towards the steeper slopes it increases okay so in general insulation ratio south facing slopes to north facing slopes increases with steeper slopes that's one concept which is incorporated into the model to understand the orographic influence other than the only elevation profile and why this is important because uh, vegetation is driven by these aspect control phenomena so while we were studying this orographic influence of precipitation so we also tried to see that okay so because uh, it's a water limited ecosystems what happened to the soil moisture variability like how it is being driven so we selected two types of topography so one is fluvial dominant uh, fluvial dominated erosions in that you have more channels okay so and one is diffusive erosion dominated landscape so in the diffusive ero erosion landscapes your uh, slopes are a bit gentler not that much so so here basically uh, this type of landscape mostly you can find yeah here in india as well because these are having more channels more tributaries and these are more uh, morely constrained to a semi arid region specific to you can say uh, desert terrains so here basically uh, i showed different factors and their effect on the soil moisture so one is radiation and so here a cv of a spatial soil moisture is plotted as a function of mean spatial soil moisture and this simulation is for 100 years and i took the mean of all those 100 years and this is the spatial pattern which we see and what are these dashed lines so these are different soil moisture states so one is hygroscopic one is wilting point and one is incipient stomata closure and one is field capacity so one uh, so for for a brief picture what does this mean so basically field capacity is that where you where your uh, you can say moisture has a after field capacity the leakage starts okay and the and then this is your incipient stomata closure where the plants begin to close their stomata and the wilting point is something you can say the end point of the water where the plants die before this so what are all these factors show and so here as circles are basically uh, this denotes your uh, fluvial dominated topography and the uh, squares are basically diffusive erosion topography so we wanted to see what happens so this is an interaction of climate topography and vegetation so what happens that uh, if we change the topography whether the variability increases or not red color is basically uniform solar radiation so uniform solar radiation means flat surface you don't have any variation in the solar radiation and that that is mostly it's a more general studies which people do so they don't account for the aspect so so what we found that you don't have much variability you have variability but in compared to this uh, uh, if you consider this aspect control and the topography driven phenomena you have higher variability in compared to the uniform control and also the fluvial dominated landscapes have higher variability than the uh, diffusive one similarly if we go towards the higher latitude so the higher latitude has uh, basically this is 45 higher variability and that higher variability is coming because of the difference in the insulation insulation ratio which i showed just the previous slide so that makes your soil moisture more variable if you go towards the higher latitude towards the equator it will it will not be uh, having any much variability then other factors so there was also another factor orographic control uh, mean annual precipitation which was our target to study and extend this so which we can see that if we increase the precipitation gradient we have more precipitation variability other factors soil and vegetation were not much dominant in this case and this was published uh, uh, two to three years back and it's still it's the top cited article for the consecutive two years for the three years yeah so the orographic precipitation so we selected some of the sites across the globe and we uh, tried to identify what happens uh, to the orographic lifting mechanism 
So in the left side, you can see this is the west coast of uh, United States. OK, so where you can see that due to orographic uh, influence, uh, this side is wet. OK, and other side of this, you can see Nevada, Oregon and all these side is a dry condition, even some parts of California as well. So uh, basically, orographic lifting mechanism strongly controls in the mountain ranges, which we discussed. And semi arid region, why I focus? Because these are the world towers for the water. So, because they are high, highly dependent on the fresh water supply from the mountains. So, as a large proportion is dependent, that's why it necessitates to model it. So, therefore, understanding the influence of precipitation topography relationship in semi arid ecosystem is critical. So, for the analysis of sensitivity of landscape. So, there have been some. Uh, literatures uh, where they have tried to identify relationship of precipitation versus elevation, but not proper. Uh, you can say uh, not properly. They have shown something, but they say that it has a linear, nonlinear and so and so and so. So here you can see this is the region in United States and New Mexico, which is also a dry region. As you can see this because mean annual precipitation is just roughly 300 millimeter. So uh, this is upper your salado. And here you can see the land cover is basically uh, it goes from grassland to the forest because this is the highest elevation and you have more precipitation here and that's obvious. In Hornet, you can see uh, the annual rainfall as a function of altitude, which was done by Wainwright. So here they show basically they got some few points and they showed some linear relationship also, but non-linear as well, but still it is uh, valid with this chunks of points. So this is all you can say highly, you can say distributed at this end. So it's not very, uh, you can say informative, but still there is an attempt they try to do because it's very complex to establish a relationship because you don't have any observations, much observations. And then there was a similar study in the northern Chile. So this was long back done by some of the scientists. So they did some for the some of the regions in the Chile and they found there is a linear relationship for at least 4000 meter of elevation. So what does the coevolution means? The coevolution means that when the landform generates when the topography uh, gets the uplift. So sim simultaneously your vegetation also is interacting with the processes, hydrological processes, geomorphological processes. So uh, this was the concept which was uh, given by Will Goose, late Will Goose. And uh, so he was the father of the landscape evolution modeling. He gave the landscape evolution model in 1991. Uh, so when he was doing his PhD in MIT. So when he gave the concept, this uh, that when you have a uh, so when you have a precipitation here uh, and towards the wind, so this is the windward direction, you will have a higher rainfall. And lower slope because of more erosion. Okay. And uh, on the other side of the mountain, you will have the lower rainfall and the higher slope. The steeper. So this is the case for the bare soil. And this uh, this is the most simple theoretical example here. However, so when vegetation comes, so you can say there is more fun in that. So here, if you see uh, when you have a higher rainfall here. You will have higher vegetation and lower erosion because of the uh, vegetation establishment. But you can have higher slope as well. OK, and why I am saying so, uh, I will explain you in the next figure. And similarly, on the other side, you will have the leeward side, the lower rainfall and the lower vegetation with higher erosion rates. OK, because you don't have any vegetation protection there and the lower slope. So let us understand why I was saying there will be higher slope despite of being high vegetation there. OK. So what happens that um, despite having higher vegetation on this side, you can have more runoff because the energy of the precipitation there is not it's you can say the energy which is driving the runoff can be more than the inhibition of the vegetation. So that means vegetation is not sufficient to protect the water from the runoff. Whereas the vice versa happens on the leeward sides. And that's what we try to investigate. Like 
whether the vegetation is more strong or the runoff component is more strong. So it's a competition trade off. So even though you have a vegetation, there can be more runoff on the windward side. These are some of the literature uh, which were done. Very few, very limited modeling studies have been done on this aspect of the landscape evolution modeling. So on vegetation, no, but for the bare soil, yes, very limited. So the group uh, from the University of Colorado, so they did some uh, background and motivation. Uh, so this is the modeling examples. So they conducted uh, like they chose uniform precipitation, then rapid conversion of cloud moisture into precipitation, different types of precipitation. And this uh, they use the child model, which I will explain you later with no vegetation component and complex precipitation algorithm. OK, then there was this study uh, from ETH Zurich from the Gorin. So they also did uh, under the uh, they also studied the orographic effect of precipitation under the constant uplift. So they showed that wet flank is longer and gentler than the dry flank due to more runoff production, which leads to more erosion. OK, but there also they don't have any vegetation component in that. So what we did, we uh, developed a vegetation component and incorporated into the child model to investigate what happens when we have the vegetation. So the understanding of the potential feedback mechanism between these vegetation patterns and landforms and their relation to hillslope aspect and climatic controls are still limited. And that's what uh, we discussed before. And to date, all modeling studies of the effect of orographic precipitation on landform evolution have considered bare soil conditions, so no vegetation. So that's what uh, we did for the first thing. So this is the model which we are using uh, currently. And uh, so this is the child LEM, which is a channel hill slope integrated landscape uh, evolution model. So it was developed at MIT as, as I uh, told you. So here you can see there are different components. You have a e, you have diff, uh, several fluxes and then you have a hydrological com components, precipitation, and then you have these are the runoff components from this and uh, then you have this root zone depth and is a porosity and several other factors. So this uh, model has the radiation balance, which is account which accounts for the albedo atmospheric transmissivity and the emissivity. So emissivity of the long wave energy balance, water balance, vegetation dynamics, and this is this coupled. OK, so this is the model. What was the model setting? So we did this model settings for the uh, New Mexico site, which is the semi-arid condition, and these are the dimensions uh, for this. And we ran the model for 800,000 years, which is a geologic time scale. And until the model, uh, until the topography get in the steady state condition, so we uh, stopped that, and then we ran the hydrologic simulation on top of the geologic simulation. And the as I discussed, the uh, solar radi radiation was uniform variable. And then we have the climate driven by uh, poison PRP model. And the mean annual precipitation is 250 mm in the central New Mexico and majority of the precipitation in the June, July, August. So how we set up the model? So we considered different cases. So one is uniform precipitation, which has the uh, 200 millimeter precipitation across the topography. OK, so this is the uniform precipitation case where all grid cells receive the same amount of precipitation. OK, then you have the uh, elevation control precipitation. So where your uh, precipitation increases up to the top altitude and then it decreases. OK, and then you have a orographic precipitation. OK, so orographic precipitation where you have higher precipitation on the windward where Precipitation increases by approximately 1.75 times. So it is 200 here and almost 300 here. The lower values in the boundary is to the peak elevations. And on the windward side, it's 1.5 times. So after setting up the model, we tried to see what happens to the vegetation. So because this was something very complex and I had to do because one simulation, it takes almost 32 days, sometimes 40 days, depending on the size you give for the grid. So this is the least we can go for this 50 meter grid cells. Uh, if we made it more coarser, so we, we may not identify some of the processes. So that's why uh, it took long time. It took long time for us to develop the vegetation component and then incorporate the orographic precipitation. 
and then understand the vegetation complexity. So these are the uh, figures which show you uh, different several uh, interactions here. So what does the A figure shows? So here basically it shows uh, the role of uniform precipitation and uniform radiation. So this is the case which normally people they study in all of the uh, their modeling studies. So where you have the uniform radiation and you uh, so what happens in the channels? In the channels you can see higher values of vegetation cover. So this highlights basically a network control. So it's obvious that where you have, will have a channels or the low gradients, you will have more water there. So you will have more kind of vegetation development on those. And then when we see elevation precipitation, elevation control on precipitation, so we were able to model because this is a theory, but we were trying to model it. So we were able to model at the higher gradient. You can see that higher precipitation. OK, so so mostly concentrated at this. So this is where you can say this is an elevation control precipitation. Then at last you have the orographic precipitation. So this was also successfully modeled where you can see that vegetation cover is higher on this end and lower on this end. OK. Then comes the complex part, the difficult part. So when you have the aspect control. So when you see the aspect control, what happens that in windward you will have some uh, pixels of north and south east west and in leeward also you will have north south east west and this kind of phenomena is very very common in western ghats as well very common okay but until now there hasn't been any such kind of study so you can see here in the deep portion that the spatial variability of solar radiation associated with the aspect driven dominates the vegetation response what I, when i said this so why are you seeing some dark pixels here? I will tell you because of two reasons. So one, these pixels are north facing pixels. So north is basically wet. That's why. And also the second reason is it, it is in the windward direction. OK, so that's the reason why you can see that north facing are more less stressed than the other pixel. But you can see more number of darker pixels here because the reason is there is a competition between the aspect as well as the uh, wind, windward and leeward direction. So these are the pixels which corresponds to the north facing. That's why they are having more wet or more vegetation cover here. A similar phenomena occurs in the heterogeneous uh, vegetation or you can say elevation control precipitation. So where aspect control of solar radiation is reflected in the presence of higher vegetation cover fraction. But in this case, the increase in vegetation cover fraction is more pronounced at the ele uh, higher elevation. So where you have, you can say the higher amount of precipitation because this is elevation control precipitation. And the last one, which is the most uh, novel one, of course, so additional effect is uh, induced because of the windward side and you will have, you can say because uh, higher vegetation cover here. Let's understand this when you have the scatter plots. So how does it look? So when we took that second row, so you can see that when you have a north south pixels, so higher vegetation cover is observed uh, on the north and the less on the uh, south. East west because of the no solar radiation, as you know, in the no solar radiation, you don't have any much variation. And then uh, for the elevation control, as you can see, so probably I will put the axis because the axis is missing from the top two. So yeah. So for the elevation control, as you can see, the vegetation cover increases as a function of elevation. So as elevation increases, it increases. And for the east west as well. When talking about the orographic, so there are many things in this. So what happens here? So I will start with the simplest one. So north wind is having the highest vegetation cover. And this is because it's in the windward direction, as I told you, and also uh, not only it's in the windward and also because of the aspect control or because of the you can say less stress, less evapotranspiration, it holds more soil moisture that converts into the vegetation cover. However, for the south leaf, because it's in the south, it doesn't benefit any anything. <clears throat> so in the south, it's in the worst condition. So it is in the south as well as in the leeward direction. Then you have a north lee and south wind, which is a competition between these two. So up to some point, you can say that this north lee is almost the low at the lowest end because of the in the leeward direction. But as soon as the elevation increases, the steepness increases, 
if you remember the uh, the initial figure where I showed you the uh, color plots, the uh, where through the steepness, as the steepness increases, you will have the wetter conditions in the north facing slopes. So that's the result of this and vice versa for this south direction. And this is not this is interesting because in this you, you don't have any aspect control. Only the orography is driving these pixels. So what next? So after this, what happens? Why this study is important? The study is important because due to this, the divide is migrating. You have a shift in the divide. So you can see. So once some of the channels, they are shifting to the other side of the domain. So that happens mostly in the windward side of the uh, mostly in the orographic influence of precipitation, where you can see the highest number of divide migrations. So basically, in uniform radiations, we don't see much of the migrations of the pixels, or no divide migration is here. In the spatial radiation, very few. And the uh, elevation control precipitation, we have some of the pixels. But the interesting thing is because of the multiple phenomena, you can see that the channels here. So a significant shift in the divide away from the center of the domain. That means our divide is shifting. So in due course and in due course of time, you can say that maybe this may become totally vanish and it may go from one side to another. So you can have to plan your systems like dam building or mine rehabilitation based on these key features. So that's why it is important and why we are looking into this. And there are several reasons. So one of the reasons was why this divide is happening on the windward side, because the mean discharge on this is higher and the slope of this is gentler compared to the leeward. So this is the some slight discussions on this. And this is the summary and conclusions which I would like to share briefly, and then I will move to a short talk on the uh, of the remote sensing. So basically, this is the simulation results showed that for uniform precipitation and uniform solar radiation, the vegetation pattern is controlled by the effect of drainage network because as higher soil moisture control in the drainage or the where you have the wetness, more wetness. And when the effect of aspect on radiation is concerned, that means the combination of uh, aspect control solar radiation and the orographic precipitation. So this effect overrides drainage control and becomes dominant, resulting in an aspect control vegetation distribution with higher cover on the NFS. And when considering the effect of orographic precipitation in spatially varied solar radiation, a more complex relationship emerged between vegetation and elevation, where you can see that uh, the pixels which were on the leeward side, it had uh, basically less, uh, less vegetation cover, less soil moisture, and so and so. Whereas on the windward side, because of the benefits from the aspect, as well as uh, benefits from the precipitation, the two things we understood, like one is precipitation and one is solar radiation, and that goes back to the bit taker. So the temperature and the precipitation, that's what we tried to model. So simple message from this study. And the divide migration in the vegetated landscapes is similar to that obtained for the bare soil landscapes. So this occurs because, as we talked, this is the competition. So this occurs because the vegetation cover close to the divide is similar on both of the ends, but the runoff discharge on the windward side is higher. So these are the key uh, lit, uh, work from this literature, from this uh, work. And these were the, some of the awards, not all mentioned here. So next, I will shift uh, my topic to the remote sensing uh, portion. So what I'm doing also currently. So this will be a brief few slides, so not much dilution. OK, so, so you don't get messed up. So I hope I will not. Uh, Kill your minds. So, so this is basically here. Uh, you can say Y scale shows you the spatial resolution, and the X axis shows you the temporal resolution. So there are basically number of satellites, and few of them are mentioned here. Based on the applications, it depends. So you, uh, most of you have heard maybe all these SMOS mission, Landsat 8. So Aster, Spot 5, Sentinel, and these are the almost temporal duration of roughly one week, you can say. Or for MODIS, it's more than one week. So sometimes 16 days or eight days. It depends what type of product you are using. And then we have some of the geostationary satellites, which have a high temporal resolution, but you have to compromise with the spatial as well, because they have starts with one kilometer resolution. Some of them, they are 500 meter, but not for the land surface purposes. So that's that's 
that's the uh, you can say beauty of these products. So they give you data at hyper temporal resolution. You can use it for basically monitoring of uh, real world features like drought and uh, pollen, pollen energy, pollen forecasting, and uh, for agricultural purpose, many things, several things can be done with that. But I am going to uh, talk about one of the satellite and which is uh, very new uh, in terms of operational at the land surface. It was being used for meteorological purpose for precipitation. So I think you might have heard. So I just so it's a new generation geostationary images developed by a uh, Japanese meteorological agency. And this is the Himavari 8, which is a geostationary satellite. It captures the 10 minute temporal observations over Asia Pacific. And the good thing is it covers India. That's a good part for us. So, and it has a large number of narrow spectral bands and it has a higher spatial resolution of one kilometer. The red band of this is at 500 meters. So, and it is, yeah, so it's, as I mentioned, so it has a higher temporal resolution and it covers basically the Asia Pacific region, including East Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and parts of the Pacific Ocean. So basically the project which I'm in, uh, involved in, so I'm working on mainly focusing on the Australian portion because uh, Australian, uh, these satellite is why beneficial for the Australia because of the bushfire and all these activities. So they are now highly reliant on this Imavari geostationary because the ghost satellite, it doesn't pass through Australia. So the advantage is that they can only rely on this and it's doing a good work. So it's predicting a pretty good accuracy. Bureau of Meteorology, so they are uh, using it as an operational for prediction. Reputation. The land surface is still in the development stage. So these are the spectral bands. So it has a 16 bands and it goes from the visible near infrared and the infrared. And you can have different types of applications for various purposes. Like as you can see that this is for a aerosol low cloud fog. So this is our domain where we are looking for the vegetation, several vegetation portions. So our job in this project is basically to process this data and apply some corrections like BRDF and all these. So that product is still uh, underway. So we haven't released to the public. So sooner in few months, we will be delivering the project to the community for the free access. And it will be the, the globally first product, which is BRDF and atmospheric corrected at one kilometer at 10 minutes the resolution. So to understand, you can say to understand maybe not the vegetation, but vegetation uh, doesn't change at the uh, sub daily scale, but you can see land surface temperature and other things with that. And it also has these swear bands as well. So you can see the plant moisture index, which is a combination of band five, six, seven. So, so for the forest fire, bush fire, so LST can be, cannot, I think it's one of the most important. Why geostationary and why people are shifting to this? Why not polar orbiting satellites? So geostationary satellites such as the advanced IMAVRI imager enable high frequency monitoring of the landscape at 10 minute intervals. So, uh, so Mura Ital, so he's in University of Hawaii. As soon as the product was released, so he just took the data and just uh, plot it down and then it was published in the Nature Scientific Report and it was one of the very key findings, very sure actually. We know that it has a high uh, number of frequency, but somebody has to do and show it. So what he showed is basically, so here on the left hand side uh, on the y axis, it is top of the atmosphere NDVI and this is year, day of, day of year. And, and uh, this is Himavari 8, okay. And here, this is the BS, which is a new generation MODIS because MODIS for some reason has been terminated in 23. Now they are releasing, uh, they are opting to say that use BS instead of MODIS. So here you can see uh, if we take this chunk and why this chunk? Because this is a greening, greening period. So this is a greening period. So we have basically, why we say greening? So this vegetation, uh, the NDVI increases here, then it goes and then it decreases. So we just took a chunk, uh, he just took a chunk of that. And if you analyze this chunk, so if you said zoom in, so you can see that out of 43 days, these are 43 days of green, 12 days with confirmed cloud-free observations. So 
the maximum value of ndvi is uh, known to be a cloud free observation if you take the top of the atmosphere because these are diluted pixels with the clouds and all these things then there, are, there is a there is a debate also some people they take the first maximum then some people they say second maximum so that's a different story that's a different study we we shouldn't go in that but he showed that okay so we can get the 12 days with confirmed cloud free observations whereas if you see in the vs in the vs if you see you can get only 6 days 6 points of cloud free observations so that shows you that it is a game changer in monitoring the cloud free observations for the vegetation okay and that's very important in the cloudy seasons if you have to predict the phenology so you need many cloud free observations another study which was done because uh, as soon as the product has arrived amazon is one of the hot spot in the world so they also showed that okay so with this they were able to monitor much more clear uh like you can say ndvi observations in the amazon and this was published in the nature communications as well so they also showed the top of the atmosphere from the ndvi because the product is still in the development stage and it hasn't been corrected so we have done that correction and it's in the uh, uh publication stage so we will release it so they also just showed that even areas like amazon so where you have high cloud contamination it can be utilized So what are the problems in the current view satellites or low earth orbiting satellites or polar orbiting satellites like modis landsat and all these it's difficult to understand how our ecosystem functions especially at sub daily and daily process because sometimes you have a event and you uh, you want you are not able to capture so at daily or sub daily scale so and if you have a eight day composite image so it's hard to identify the process that what is happening at So that hypertemporal resolution so you need some kind of data and every time you as i mentioned that every time you don't have the observation so some models need to be established to predict these uh, natural hazards which is which are happening i think which is increasing in this climate change era the two or three climates, clear sky observations available during the two week expansion which is the drawback in this for orbiting satellites and this is how himavari 8 looks so here is a vs the three caps three uh, captures equator and all these combination and here you can see continuous you can see a motion picture the movement of the uh, you can say the clouds and everything similarly there the bureau is doing for the bushfire as well and the pollen also so they are predicting with the help of the satellite with the help of the top of the atmosphere so not yeah so it's doing a good job i think uh, it's the future it's many uh, so some of the groups from the japan uh, one of the group from the japan they meant uh, they mentioned and they are the best in that so they mentioned that it's a future of the satellite era so what are the future pathway to the sustainable future and emerging research directions so i would say that uh, basically innovative approaches like the coupling of the topography and the climate vegetation is very hard and one needs to understand because this is not one uh, area it's an interdisciplinary area so we only need to come together and to understand this climate and interaction of topography and vegetation within the earth system model so earth system model is a broad category so where you can have the biophysical models land surface models and other various kind of models so we need to integrate that and we need to integrate very 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 carefully so that we can predict the processes like floods wildfire heat waves and droughts worldwide not only limited to india and also there exists a critical research gap uh, in comprehending the combined attention so bridging this gap will be crucial in starting a sustainable path toward a greener and more water efficient future and the last one which i focus more here is and i always encourage this because this is something new and people uh, it's under explored so i would encourage everyone to come together and uh, work on the geostationary satellites and its application to understand the vegetation response to climate change and also to enable more accurate projections of future ecosystem changes so it has a wide applications not only limited to the uh, you can say bushfire or something related to floods or the drought so you can also apply in the health sector as well so people are using for the health pollen forecasting 
so and it's major major you can say one of the problem in australia so like you have a weather forecasting so in australia uh, there uh, so we have some uh, pollen forecasting as well and it's monitored uh, at hourly basis and they, that's that's one of the uh, you can say after the melbourne thunderstorm in 2016 where a lot of people they suffered some of them they died so it was a major outbreak it was a tsunami uh, in the <clears throat> pollen energy so that's something which we can account in india as well so this is something for the health aspect also i would like to just acknowledge uh, the you can say all the authors of this work all the Alfredo, who is my supervisor, Patricia, Omar, Jose, Mauro, and all of them from the various organizations. Yes. Last but not the least, I would must my sincere thanks to Dr. Yogesh Tiwari for hosting me at IIT in Pune, and I truly appreciate the opportunity. And I learned a lot during these two days, though it is a short visit, but I learned many different aspects from various. I think you can say encouraging researchers, and I, I am. Truly really honored to be here, and happy for collaboration on several aspects. These are this is my email ID if you would like to work, and this is this was my PhD uh, celebration for the back time. It's a tradition only in the Newcastle, not any other university in Australia. So this is only in the Newcastle. Here I was roam around across the campus, the brigade of the people were lining up there. So every, uh, so everywhere where it goes, it collects all the people, and they just march around the campus. Thank you. Thank you, Ankur. Uh, it's a really very informative talk because a lot of informations are hidden uh, in in this uh, talk. Uh, I think youngsters will take uh, inspiration and they will use the Himavari data and another data also for doing the research. Uh, so uh, I I am sure that the, I think youngsters will have some questions. If you have, just raise the hand and then. We can discuss uh, with Ankur. Yeah, open. Hi, Ankur. Very nice presentation. So, for the first part of your talk, where you are discussing the co evolution of uh, landform and the vegetation, so whether the model was specifically tuned towards the New Mexico region? Um, Okay, and then uh, yeah. So you told that once the landform evolution starts taking place, then the precipitation at the maximum point was like 1.75 times higher as compared to the previous one. So was it corresponding to the real? I mean, the situations which which is there existing at that location. And the another the other question is once the vegetation starts appearing and at the same time your slope is increasing in time let us say due to the upliftment of that thing so whether the vegetation changes in time or it was fixed for the entire i mean the type of vegetation throughout that 800000 of years it was kind of same vegetation but only maybe adjusting to the slope and the runoff and the moisture content yeah so thank you so much for your question so uh, for your first question uh, uh, you were asking about the uh, relationship, like which I have got. Or is is it available in the real world side? To to that, the answer is yes. And uh, I didn't show it here here because we have some of the published literature where we extracted that information and then we set up our, our model. Yes. So this is based on the real world catchment side. The second one is uh, we take the vegetation as a dynamic, so it it changes over time. For this 800,000, it interacts with the precipitation and uh, like whatever amount of rainfall you are getting. So it changes over time. So coevolution is something, if it is constant, then there is a meaning. So there is a meaning, but it won't depict you much real picture. So the vegetation is the, the dynamic. I hope I have answered. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So thanks, Ankur, for this nice talk. So I have two questions actually. So when you actually developed the vegetation, I mean, in your model, the vegetation actually evolved. So you considered wind and then the that angle of the radiation, basically, the kind of per square feet, how aspect. much radiation you're getting, aspect, yeah, yeah, aspect basically. Whether yeah. it is perpendicular or glancing, that aspect, right? Now, if it is windward, then along with the precipitation, the wind speed also varies. The wind strength also varies. And we know that the vegetation, they're also sensitive to the wind. If it is very windy, then tall vegetations do not appear over there. So 
speed it, we didn't consider the wind speed aspect in that so our wind speed was constant for that so we didn't uh, consider it because already it is a very uh, complex to involve the vegetation and then if we go for the wind speed so this is something other domain so we have to take expertise from other people as well so no, that is that is the kind of impression i got from your presentation because even if you look into any this kind of ecotones or any this kind of vegetation changes occurred along with the slope you will see that even if on the windward side as you were showing in the pictures that vegetation but not on the top that yeah, is yeah. because of the wind because the wind is strongest at the at the top at so the we place. have the vegetation at the top because you have not exactly on the top somehow little bit lower side I and mean, exactly at the top it is always no no we have uh, we have at the top because it, uh, we have a higher that's that's the concept of the theory behind if you see uh, so if you see here so this is exactly the pictures of your actual vegetation which one the real life situations the real images that you showed oh okay so you want to say okay Yeah, go yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. top, actually, see where where it is actually the crest. No, uh, no, no. Uh, I I think you are getting confused. This is uh, nothing. Uh, so this is not orography. This is aspect. They are mixing two things. So this is aspect. I mean, control. I mean, you see that picture on the top for Mongolia, yeah, and yeah, you yeah, see yeah. that there is a north facing uh, side and south yes. facing side, but exactly on the top where it is still north facing, vegetation doesn't appear. That is because of the wind. if the wind is strongest at the top actually the vegetation doesn't appear because they face a lot of resistance that is related to the boundary layer resistance and surface resistance so that is one aspect and secondly what i wanted to ask you did you also consider the resource limitations like let's say on the leeward side and windward side your soil texture is different soil nutrient type is different did you incorporate that as no our or? soil uh, texture was uh, just so we have the information what type of soil we have on the windward and we have what we have on the leeward side so because there have been some studies prior to our study which did a very intense extensive soil uh, science studies like they have some instruments they have measured like what type of soil texture and so we just took the information bought the information from there and we just incorporated into the model so soil is not uniform it's changes and one final question actually because we see this in the real life even if you go to himalaya or any other kind of uh, mountainous but, but region himalayan uh, himalayan region uh, cannot be uh, same like this because that is something uh, as i told you it's not a water limited ecosystem no you go to okay i just give it as an example go to any other forested region which is on the mountain you will see the species actually changes the only vegetation but depending on the height the species type also changes yeah, you yeah, see yeah. pine the oak yeah, 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 all yeah. these have their own uh, own preferable own so preferred that, altitude that's, that's a very good question in this our species doesn't change it vegetation doesn't mean, changes dynamically but our uh, the vegetation type is same so did you incorporate the thing i was so it's 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 the same so one thing is that uh, the vegetation changes dynamically with time but the vegetation type is constant yeah same you yeah. have done it at the vegetation level not at the species level maybe no right? no no that will be i think uh, it don't think uh, ask first of all if you want to know the species you need to know like you need to contact ecological and they don't do much studies at such high mountain no actually yeah. actually i have come across several studies in pinas and all and these are actually done not by i mean they take help from the ecologists but these are mostly done by theoretical physicist what they do they take a particular region let's say savanna ecosystem and the kind of primary producers you have how many grasses you have how much of grassland and how much how that can support your entire food pyramid and based on that the model actually stochastic in nature that comes into some equilibrium so this kind of model starts called stochastic modeling so if you can import incorporate three or four species on top of this that can, that will actually stabilize so, and that will show you the so after, after we did this study so uh, some of the researchers like uh, from the university of washington which is erkens group so now they are taking care of this model because now they have so when i started this work so this was totally in c++ so now they have converted this model into python so it's open source known as land lab so now they are trying to do is uh, incorporate different uh, vegetation types as well as the species so they are successful in incorporating vegetation types like shrublands forest and all these things but still they are working on the species portion Oh, but it's a long time because their group is working almost since five years <clears> time, and after I stopped, so they are just continuing ahead. So they're one of the PhD yeah, students. Yeah, your work is very comprehensive. Just couple so, it with a competition model, and it can. Yeah. Return. So, but our next task is basically validating with the satellite. So that's, but not going into the complexity of. <laughs> yes, you are right, but at the same time, it's it's a very daunting task. Like you have to just first contact the ecological uh, people, and then sometimes you don't get the exact. 
data. The, the data availability is a very challenging task to get in such mountainous terrain. And then another uh, daunting task is that even if you get it, the challenge is how you have to uh, like you have to make uh, a code or something where you can show the interaction of vegetation precipitation and then different vegetation species or something at large scale. At, at a small scale, it's still doable, but at large scale, it's difficult. It's very difficult. It's complex. Yeah, it's an another objective if you have to go through. Yeah. So yeah, so so first thing was start with the simple, incorporate the vegetation because there is no study with the vegetation. No, none of the studies they do only on bare soil. So if you do the vegetation, the story changes because of the feedback and different different kind of mechanism. So when you do the vegetation, even with they start with the simple thing. Then you see, okay, this is the picture, and then we can go forward ahead with this. Yeah, so our like, next task is to do with the satellite observations because now we have this imagery, so we can just validate, okay, what we are getting with this. So now we have the modeling. Now we have to do some satellite. Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, you can take Western Ghats as an example, like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even yeah, in, so. yeah, yeah, Western Ghats is the one of the yeah. you can say most uh, exciting. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And what Pramit mentions about this wind speed, probably if you see any other example anywhere where vegetation is less at the top, where wind speed is more, maybe you can consider. Maybe you can write some paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. We will. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Is this model more suitable for old mountain kind of structure which is evolving in time, or like so first of lava and then. No, 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 no. So if you have an outburst of lava, so that is a different kind of uh, modeling you have to do because that is something related to volcanic eruption and all these. So that, that is that, that is different. So you have to do. So this is only for the you can say if you have a soil mantle topography. So you shouldn't have you shouldn't have much of the uh, you can say it should be pristine. So it shouldn't be uh, touched with any kind of uh, natural factor. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Students, do you have any questions? Yeah, you may ask uh, uh, if you have any doubt or anything. Yeah, with that. I think you have already answered what I wanted to ask, but still, <laughs> the, the model can be said to be very reliable only if you have some control run and you can compare with some observations, like you are mentioning that you already have NDVI observations from Himwari, but some control run has to be compared. Then only we can rely on the model so, uh, so like an oversimplification of the exact processes so this was this was uh, and, calibrated and, yeah and another question i have is as you mentioned is uh, you your model is having dynamic vegetation that primarily depends upon two factors uh, you were mentioning precipitation and solar insulation so how will you attribute these two factors let's say on one side vegetation is is 20% less than the other side so how will you attribute how much percentage of this is coming from the differences in solar insulation and how much this is coming because of uh, the changes in precipitation? So exact attribution, uh, how will you understand? So, yeah, so the second question is a very uh, tricky question which you asked because it's, it's hard to quantify between the, uh, like, the amount of the vegetation which is coming from the uh, impact, like feedback from the solar radiation and the precipitation. But the, for the first question, I will answer first one. So for the first one, we calibrated our model uh, for the uh, New Mexico site with some of the observations. We had some observations and we also calibrated from satellite Modis LI and all these, and we also had soil moisture data for some period of time. So it's two, three years are enough for that spin up period. And then we set up the model for that. So, so it was like it was uh, calibrated based on the observed conditions for the uh, experimental site. The second thing, uh, when you uh, when we say that uh, if we can uh, quantify the impact between these two, it's, as I mentioned, that it's hard. Like it's 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 uh, in this scenario, we can only tell that okay. So we are because we are more interested in the process. So what happens if this precipitation happens on the orographic influence uh, with the orographic influence on the mountain range in combination with aspect control? The quantification is the you can say once we model the process, at least what we are saying in theory 
if we are able to model these process that's that's an uh, achievement because that's an achievement we are trying we are able to simulate the real world process then comes the quantification and that quantification can be done uh, by several uh, indices like vegetation indices and also uh, doing some uh, kind of you can say multi collinearity analysis and something identifying which factor is giving this much type of vegetation so that we can do so that is something uh, it's uh, it's on uh, it's uh, not in our mind but yeah thank you for that we can do that by separating in quantification or all these so we are just mostly interested in the process i understand yeah. i mean this too, too much of a complexity may, may be added to this model yeah, it yeah. looks like it's a, a much much simplified version of the real process so yeah. many level of complexity may be added as yeah 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 yeah, yeah. you are right you are right as at the win, at the win speed so i mentioned and also factor. there could be several other factors let's say precipitation you are saying that in the wind ward side because the amount of precipitation is more so there could be more uh, soil erosion but with soil erosion also there could be some damage to the local vegetation also so that yeah 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 you are right you are right that that has many things i think uh, because so this is uh, many things can happen because there can be different types of vegetation because if you go uh, towards the higher so because of the temperature you can find different vegetation you won't you won't find same similar kind of vegetation there can be other kind of activities which uh, like which are something which i heard from the local people there can be some cattle grazing so yeah. that also also affects these kind of activities that, yeah, yeah there may be some minor so many things also, yeah many things many things that can be happen but to start with at least yeah, yeah. we just Yeah. It's always better to start with the most simplified model yes. and then add level of complexity yes, over that. Start with something. So still they are. You was uh, mentioning some term PRP just to add climate noise in your model. What is that? Could you please explain? This is. Uh, yeah. Yes, well, what is that? What happens that we take the precipitation, for example, for uh, duration of one year or how long we are taking this? and then we divide that precipitation based on the storm duration storm intensity and the monsoonal period so we just give the fraction value of that in particular that monsoon season so for example 50% of it it is in jjs so we just give that precipitation in that and then rest of the precipitation is distributed for the non growing season okay the, the exact the, exact ten cycle like, exact ten cycle like you are not giving right okay thank you okay any other question no okay so uh, no question then we thank uh, dr ankur just give him uh, the applause and then uh, thank you very much for visiting us and then enlightening our knowledge uh, about this so i hope uh, many people will contact you